is the lifter of our heads. That is the God we serve. That is the God that's here this morning to encounter us, yeah? So could we bring him every praise we have to bring, every song we have to sing? Let's welcome our creator with praise. Come on.
here that can testify to the goodness of God this morning? Anybody? I know I can. I can't help but wonder if there are people in this room who are searching and wondering, people who are online watching, who are searching and wondering if this God is really who He says He is, if He's really as good as we say that He is. And I'm here to say that He is. He is. He is that good. I can testify. He redeemed my life from the pit. He's called me out of darkness into glorious life. He's delivered me from debilitating fear and anxiety in my own life and called me to do this thing that would have terrified me the most. And He can do this for you. He gives beauty for ashes, a garment of praise for a spirit of heaviness. This is our God. This is our God. So if you're wondering this morning, if you are searching this morning, I want to tell you he is this good yes. and he can do it. Yes. Amen. Yeah. Yes, thank you, God.
This morning as a church, we're rallied around an amazing truth that there's no one better than God. He's amazing. He comes into our brokest, our most broken, most painful moments and says, I love you, I've got you, I'm here with you, and I'm at work in your life. Whether you feel it or not, believe it or not, God is there. As we were singing that song this morning, I couldn't help but think about a community in Buffalo. We are singing that, you turn graves into gardens. Community in Buffalo that just facing another mass shooting in their community. And we're a church that believes that when we pray, God moves. And God does stuff that only he can do, as that song just said. Only you can do it. So this morning, before we receive our tithes and offerings, we're going to stand in the gap for that community. Those family members, those friends who are grieving the senseless murder, the murders that they're, they're, they're grieving right now, they're hurting. We're going to pray for that. Are you, guys, are you guys with me this morning in that? Okay, let's pray for that. Father, we thank you that you're a big God that you're a loving God, that you are a God who is in control. And we pray that you would bring peace to that community in Buffalo. We pray for those families that have lost loved ones. God, would you be their comforter? Would you be the one that comes alongside and whispers to them that it's going to be okay because you are the God who redeems all things. Lord, we pray for our country today. We pray that you would bring peace. Lord, we pray that you would bring peace to those hearts that are full of violence, that are full of anger. We pray that those struggling with mental illness would get the help that they need. Lord, we pray for an end to violence in our country. Lord, would you bring peace through your church, through your people? Will you mobilize the church in Buffalo to be the hands and feet of you, Jesus, to bring healing to that community? God, we thank you. We pray for that community to touch them in the name of Jesus. We thank you. And everybody said, amen. As always, church, there's multiple ways to give. We're gonna continue to worship as we give. singing to the great initiator. I heard that this morning as I was getting up trying to think of what to say in this moment. God is the great initiator. He goes first. Everything that we have is because God did it first. We sing because he sings over us. We worship him because he saved us and redeemed us. We breathe because he breathed first. 
in us. Aren't you glad this morning that we serve an initiator, that we serve one that goes first? We're going to continue in our, in our day for it in a moment, but for right now, how about you turn to the left of you, to the right of you, reach across the aisle, shake someone's hand, hug somebody across the neck, give a strong head nod, a fist bump. Best Brady's going to come up in one second. Good morning, good morning. How are you? You doing good, doing well? Yeah, big uh, thank you. Four of you are doing great. That's good. Guess that's why we come to church. I uh, big weekend at the Boyd House. We got a graduate, a college graduate at my house now, so big deal. And uh, just so proud of Abram coming through college, graduating with honors, and now he can go get a job. And uh, that's, that's really, that's all that's left. Go get a job. <laughs> no, very, <laughs> very, very proud of him. I said, listen, you can take the whole weekend off. You don't have to go get a job till Monday. <laughs> I thought that was pretty gracious, don't you think? 48 hours. No, we, he's going <laughs> to, I thought he could take some time, you know. So it's good to be with you guys. How many of the guys really enjoyed Justin Simmons on Thursday night? Wasn't that great? <laughs> really enjoyed him. I was thinking on the way home how easy it is to pick on professional athletes, and there's plenty of evidence out there that you know, gives you the opportunity. But Justin was just a breath of fresh air, just authentic, Jesus-loving, kind, really compassionate young man, and he's an all-pro safety that will light you up and I, you know, on, on the field, and I love that. And so anyway, thought, thank, you all for, thank you for coming. Thank you for being a part of that. Turn in your Bible to Acts chapter 2. And while you're doing that, let me remind you that our prayer meetings every week are now on Wednesday through the summer. It's our summer schedule. So Wednesday morning at 7.30, Wednesday at noon, and then we added a Wednesday night prayer service every week at 6.30. So if you can, I really want to encourage you, listen, uh, our world needs a praying church right now. Is that right? Would you say amen to that? Doesn't need an angry church. It doesn't need a, an argumentative church. The world right need, now needs a prayerful church. And I'm going to show some of this to you in Acts chapter 2 today. Acts chapter 2, we started last week in, in the beginning of this chapter talking about when the Holy Spirit came. And when the Holy Spirit came, there were tongues of fire and wind blowing through the room and people speaking in other languages. And Peter steps out and calls the crowd to salvation. Thousands of people come into the church that day. And now we're going to skip ahead into chapter 2. And I want to pause here because I want to address something. I know, especially in the last three years especially, it seems like that it's been very easy to lose trust in institutions. Government, church, whatever the institutions that have held us together, it's been very, very easy in the last three years to throw shade, to disrespect, dishonor, to even have outright evidence to support your claim. And I, I want to say to you that all man-made institutions will fail us. Let me say that again, because maybe you don't believe that. All man-made institutions are flawed, inherently flawed. And the reason they're inherently flawed is they're led by inherently flawed human beings, right? And I also understand why it's, it's easy to criticize the institution of the church, of which I belong, of which I lead. And I, 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 every week it seems like there's another story of a fallen pastor or a church in some kind of scandal. And every time I read them, listen very carefully, I know a lot of these people that are in the headlines right now. And as someone who knows them, 
and as someone who was aware of what was going on, my heart is broken, crushed. And I understand why you in the room and those of you watching online may look at the church, the mega church or whatever you wanna call it, and be a little suspicious. And I wanna to talk to you today about why I have hope still in the local church. And it's not because of men. It's not because of institutional prowess. It's not because of some tricky strategy that we've come up with. I really wanna tell you today how, simple I, how simply I think about the church when I stand here and lead you week after week, day after day. This passage of scripture has formed and shaped me as a leader more than any other passage of scripture in all of the Bible. When I lead you as your pastor at New Life Church, I'm thinking through the lens of Acts chapter two, verse 42 through 47. So I'm gonna read that with you today, and then we're gonna pray, and then we're gonna dive into these holy texts. Is that okay with you? Is that a good plan? All right, verse 42. He's talking about the church now, the gathered group of people. He says, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. By the way, the breaking of bread there, he's not talking about the Lord's table, he's talking about carbs, okay? I just wanna give you some good news. <laughs> now he's gonna talk about the Lord's table later on in this passage, but he's talking about bread right there, real bread. That's not, that's not some kind of uh, you know, symbolism. He's talking about good bread. That's why I have such hope for the church, right? One of the reasons. <laughs> Look at verse 43, and when good fresh bread was around, everyone was filled with awe and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles and all the believers. Come on, say that, those three words with me. All the believers were together. They weren't scattered. They were together and had everything in common. In other words, there was a spirit of generosity that was permeating from the group, selling their possessions and goods they gave to anyone as he had need. I love verse 46, every day. You know, they had church every day back then. They didn't wait until Sunday. They gathered all the time. They were a persecuted people being hunted down and imprisoned. Their very safety, their very survival depended on them being together, encouraging one another, laying hands on one another, making sure that they had food that day. I have more than enough food, so here's enough food for you to take home with your family. That required daily participation. And they broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And I love this. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Let's pause for a moment. Let's pray together over this text. Father, thank you so much for your word that's living and active. I'm not reading ink from a paper, I'm reading the voice of God, the, um, the utterance of God today. And I pray today that you would give us hearts to hear it, eyes to see, ears to hear something new today, faith to believe what we're hearing, and courage to be obedient. So Father, we prayed for that today in the name of the Father and the Son, and we welcome the work of the Holy Spirit, the person of the Holy Spirit, of which all this is made possible. In your name, amen? Amen. So I wanna talk just real quickly about what the Holy Spirit was doing. We're in a series of messages talking about Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but the, the, the one thing the Holy Spirit did was birth the church. Now they were gathering, the church certainly existed before this passage of scripture, but it came alive and caught fire because of the Spirit. I wanna be a part of a church that is alive living, active, breathing church. So what were the four foundations of this church? And by the way, these are the four foundations of New Life Church. Maybe some of you are new, maybe you've just started attending New Life Church. I've been the pastor here almost 15 years. The church is 38 years old. And I can tell you from its very genesis, from the early days of New Life Church, the foundations that I'm about to show you are the reason that we have survived the reason we have thrived, and the reason that our future is very hopeful. One is that they were a learning church. As they said, they were devoted, devoted to the apostles' teaching. 
And I, I want to stop here and pause just for a moment and make, make sure you understand something. Learning means that you are open to new information and while at the same time holding to the firm foundational convictions that you know to be true. So there's two things in tension here, okay, new life. Two things that should always be in tension in your life. There are some absolute beliefs that we will not, I will not ever compromise on. I will always hold the scriptures up in high regard. I will always push Jesus to front and center for everything we're doing, no matter what the, the culture dictates, no matter what changes happen out in the world, you come to New Life Church, you're going to hear the scriptures taught and Jesus worshiped. Always, 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 always. So those are things that are, are not open for discussion. I will not compromise. I will not back down. I will stand here, if there's three people in the room, I'm going to stand here and proclaim Christ is the Lord and his scriptures can be trusted. Amen. Every Sunday, Sunday after Sunday after Sunday. That's true, okay? So that, let's put that on the table as something that's never going to change. Now, with that said, are you willing to grow and learn? Because I can tell you this for an absolute certainty. No one in this room and no one watching online knows all there is to know about God. He's much bigger than that. He's much more complex than the human mind. And while you may know a great deal about the nature and the character and the goodness and the mercies and the forgiveness of God, you have yet to scratch the surface of the magnificent God who created the universe, established the heavens, fill the earth with animals and human beings, that God you will not understand completely. In fact, I think you're going to spend all of eternity standing before him, trying to understand how marvelous and how good and how powerful God is. Don't think for a moment that you have all of your theology neatly bottled up and packaged up because you will, that, if you ever think like that, you'll start worshiping a particular ideology and you will no longer become the learner and the thinker and the person who's growing in their knowledge of God. Are you catching this today? So the early church understood that. We have our absolute beliefs that we will not compromise. But I walk in every Sunday knowing that I'm gonna discover something about you and something about God that I did not think was true. My mind is open. Listen, I read books from pastors that I don't agree with. I watch news channels that don't vote like me. I am constantly opening up my heart and mind to people who are not like me. And the reason is I am determined to understand, I am determined to learn while not losing any of my convictions. I'm called to the earth to reach the people who are different than me. I'm called to the earth to be a witness to people who are not like me. I'm not going to demonize them. I'm not gonna cast hate upon them. I'm gonna to try to understand their point of view while not budging an inch on the absolutes of my faith. It's possible, brothers and sisters, to be perpetual learners in a culture that tells you to go and hide and be fearful of other people that are different. That's not what we're called to do. Because here's what I believe, the Spirit of God, if you're filled with the Spirit, you will always be led back to the Word of God. The Spirit of God will lead us back to the Word of God. If what you're being led to is not the Word of God, then you're not being led by the Spirit of God. That was really good, by the way, okay? <laughs> that was better than I thought. In other words, if your conclusion the things that you're upset about and aggravated, if it, you can't open the scriptures and show me why you're aggravated, it's not the Spirit of God that's motivating you. The Spirit of God leads you back to the Word of God. They are in congruence with one another. They are in unity. You can't break the unity of the scriptures in the Spirit. They're married to one another. 
It was the scriptures that breathed through men and they wrote these scriptures. You can't divorce the two. You can't separate the two. You can't come between the two of them. They are forever and always knit together. To have one is to have the other. Are you catching this today? So the teachings of the apostles in the early church, the teachings of the apostles created a sense of steadiness and predictable growth. Listen, I know I am not the coolest person. I'm really not. I stopped trying to be cool a long time ago because I was really bad at it. I don't think I'm the funniest person. I'm not the most entertaining person you can find on the internet. There's a lot of pastors that are great at entertaining their, their congregations. I've tried to do that. I was a failure. What you can define for me though is a steadfastness. I really am the same every time you see me with very few exceptions. When you come here on Sunday, you're gonna get just about the same thing. And the reason is because in an unsteady world, I think we need a steady church. We don't need more entertainment. I don't need more entertainment. I don't, need, I don't want church to look like Netflix or some streaming service. I want the church to be the steady, predictable, powerful presence that it was created to be. So they were a learning church. Here's the second thing, they were a loving church. In fact, this is what caused the church to explode. It says they were, they were devoted to the fellowship. And that word fellowship is koinonia. It means a gathering, listen very carefully, a gathering where we give and where we receive. Let me stop here for a moment. You know the two reasons that people stop coming to church in America? There are two predominant reasons. One group of people, they're embarrassed and ashamed and they're convinced that their lives don't measure up. And so out of shame and guilt, they stay away. God help us that we've not been more welcoming to those people. But there is a feeling among some people, my life is too broken. When I get my act together, I'll come to church. That's a lie of the enemy, by the way. But this is a second group that you may not be aware of. I'm too successful to need church. That's really the main reason in middle-class America that church attendance is in decline. It's not because of brokenness, that is true for some people. It's because of success. I, 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 I don't need what the church has, I have all I need. When your bank account is full, when your kids are healthy, when your business is thriving, I have watched my friends over the years, once they get to a place of success, they drift away from the congregation thinking that the church can't provide for them anything. And that's a wrong idea, it's a wrong idea of church. Actually, when you become more successful, you're more needed at the church than ever before. We need you in the church. But look, in every last 20 years, every statistical research that's ever been done shows the same thing. The richer people become, more money they become, they give a lesser percentage to the church. Their percentage of giving goes down with the more money that they make. You know why? Because they've lost their solidarity with the poor. We live in upper middle class, white suburban neighborhoods. Most of us did not drive past a homeless family to get here this morning. You probably did not see a tent city in your neighborhood. You may not even have any close friends who are struggling with addiction or poverty, wondering where their next meal will be. But when you know those people, you know the power of your gift and the power of your presence. Your giving and your presence and your wisdom can save families. This is, this, is, this is why I go down and drive around the neighborhood where Mary's home is all the time, Sand Creek neighborhood. I get out, I meet the neighbors, I know the, I know the women that we have in our program, our medical clinic, I go stand in the lobby. Why? Because I don't want to lose solidarity with what God is doing. And in our church, we can never lose our, 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 our grip and our compassion and our solidarity with the most broken people in the city. I love what Eugene Peterson says. He says, don't let the church you want keep you from loving the church that you have. Listen, we're not always gonna be, we're gonna disappoint you. I'm going to disappoint you. I had a guy walk up to me a couple of weeks ago. He goes, you know, I've been here for a long time and you've disappointed me quite often. I said, that's actually my job. Thank you. Because if I don't disappoint you from time to time, then I'm not challenging any of you. 
then we just become this big echo chamber where we agree on everything. My job is to push a little bit, to push you to think differently sometimes. And you're gonna get aggravated with me. You're gonna get upset with me, but you're gonna really like me, I promise. Hang in here. Here's the third thing, they worry, worshiping church. I, I wanna get back to this place in the church where every, every gathering was considered a sacred meeting, a holy presence, a meeting where the holy presence of the Lord was there with us. That we uh, don't ever walk into one of these gatherings and services not believing that God is here among us, that there's a holy, thick presence of grace in Jesus among us all the time. They, see, the early church had this idea that when they came to the Lord's table, that every meal was a foretaste of the messianic banquet promised by Jesus in the new heaven and the new earth. They had this sense of sacredness. Now, I know those cups are awful. And it's the worst piece of bread you're ever gonna put in your mouth. And the juice is, it's healthy, but it's awful. But I do know that when I take that little cup and the little plastic container, that I'm gathering with the church around the world and I am hitching up to a story. I'm linking myself to a story that's been told for 2000 years. And that's why I consider it a holy moment, a moment of awe that my life is now being written into the story that's been told for 2000 years. They were a worshiping church. Listen, don't, I don't come here waiting for John Egan or Terrell D. Wilson to get me ready to worship. I come in here ready to worship. I'm, I come in here ready to encounter God. I come in ready to hear the voice of the Lord and to re respond to what he's saying to me. They were a worshiping church and then they were a prayerful church. Every church in the world prays. Only a handful become praying churches. And that's why I keep inviting you to these Wednesday gatherings. You wanna know what the soul of our church is? It's a handful of people gathered in the World Prayer Center. You wanna know what, where the engine of the church is? Come to the prayer meetings, you'll find them. You wanna know what keeps the church moving forward? Gather in these prayer meetings. And listen, I believe in private, personal prayer. But the greatest miracles in the New Testament, with few exceptions, happened in corporate gatherings of prayer. When they were, when the disciples were let out of prison, when people were raised to life, it says the church was gathered and praying. They were a prayerful church and I'm calling New Life Church back into an attitude and a season of prayer. Don't forsake these prayer meetings. Come and be a part of these sacred gatherings when your schedule allows, all right? All right the question I have then, if that's true, if all three, if those four things are in place, what happens? I'm gonna share three things with you today, okay? Number one, miracles happen. In verse 43, it says, everyone was filled with awe. The word awe is, a, is actually the word phobos. It means this reverent fear. There's a, there's a, when, when you realize that the holy God is present with us, when you realize that God has chosen to make his dwelling among us, when you realize that God is standing in front of you, there's something that happens in the human soul. There's an awakening. A phobos happens. It's a reverence. It's a quietness even. There's really no words to describe what you're feeling, so you just decide to stand there in holy reverence. Righteous fear. And there's a sense of expectation. You see, we tend to get what we anticipate. You know what's gonna to happen today? You're going, you anticipated what would happen in this church service today. You walked in here with a set of expectations. What I'm asking you today is would you raise your expectations? What I'm asking you today is when you walk into those prayer meetings on Wednesday, when you come to Friday night or Sunday morning, I want you to walk in with some raised expectations because you always get what you anticipate. And, and there's nothing I've found in my life, there's nothing more powerful than a group of faithful people anticipating and expecting God to be present. Now, I've got a little bit of allergy, so I'm gonna put a little thing in my mouth so I don't cough on you, all right? I wanna read this to you. <laughs> I was reading this this week, Ann Dillard. Uh, she's just a fantastic writer. She was talking about church. 
And I just thought, when I read it, I have to read this to New Life Church. She's talking about expectations. She's talking about awakening your heart to what really is happening among us. So listen to this, listen to what she said. She says, why do people in church seem like cheerful, brainless tourists <laughs> on a package tour of the absolute? Does anyone have the foggiest idea what sort of power we blithely invoke? Or as I suspect, does no one believe a word of it? The churches are children playing on the floor with their chemistry sets, mixing up a batch of TNT to kill a Sunday morning. I love this part. It's madness to wear ladies' straw hats and velvet hats to church. We should all be wearing crash helmets. <laughs> Ushers should issue life preservers and signal flares. They should lash us to our pews, Ann Dillard. For the sleeping God may awake someday and take offense, or the waking God may draw us to where we can never return. That's the church. She has had her eyes open. You know what power we're playing with here? When we pray these prayers, when we sing these songs, when we come together, you know what, how powerful it is to lay hands on someone and pray for them? Life and death happens. Power happens. Strength comes. And we're playing with a force and a fire that we're not even aware of sometimes. We don't, we don't even understand what we're happening. And this is why I love Ann Dillard. They should give us crash helmets. So next Sunday. <laughs> so miracles happen. Here's the second thing. People find hope and strength. And this is why I'm calling you when you find yourself in a most successful place. Maybe right now your 401k is thriving. Your business is thriving. Your investments are doing well. We need you. There are people who are struggling. Food scarcity is about to become even a more real thing for about 20% of the families in El Paso County. It was a real thing during COVID. Do you know that? Do you know that we had people from Briargate who didn't have food in their homes? A lot of families showed up at our door needing groceries that live in your neighborhoods. And I believe because of what's happening in the Ukraine, what's happening with inflation, the church has got to show its strength now. We're about to see more and more people, they're gonna find themselves in hopeless situations. The good news is we are a hope-filled people, full of hope. So let's give it away. Let's give something away. Verse 45 says, they gave to anyone as he had need. That's the generous spirit of this church. I've watched that all these years, how generous you are and how quickly you respond when fires ravaged our city, you responded. When fires ravaged Black Forest, you responded. When people found themselves with food scarcity, you responded. When we, when we discovered that we could buy an apartment complex, pay cash for it, and fill it with single moms and their children, you responded. That's the nature, that's, that's been built into your DNA. That's not a gift from me, it's not a gift from your parents. That is the work and the activity of the Holy Spirit when generosity swells up inside a church and explodes to the community around them. But here's my favorite part of this. Miracles happen, people find hope, but the prodigals start coming home. And I want you to look at verse 47, and the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. New Life Church, we just baptized 268 people in two weeks. Amazing stories. Listen, that doesn't happen. That's a miracle. And I can just tell you that I'm beginning to hear the stories. People come into faith that were a long way. Two and three years ago, some of these families would have called themselves atheists, but somebody reached out to them. What I, what I love about it is that during the pandemic, when I, most of us retreated to our homes, there were a group of us who stayed on mission and kept loving our neighbor, kept inviting our neighbor over. And now we're seeing the fruit of that evangelistic activity because one of the marks of the church 
is that salvation, radical change of life should be a common occurrence in every congregation that calls on Jesus. I love I loved that the early believers, when they would come to this moment, the early believers called their communion love feast. They called them love feast. And the reason it was so joyful, there was so much laughter and joy and kindness and compassion. And think about this. When was the last time you walked near a group of people and they were genuinely in love with one another? I mean, love in a way that they were committed to one another. And there was laughter and joy and generosity among them. That's a group of people I want to be a part of. It's a party. That's, that's an intoxicating invitation to a world of people who are hurting and lonely right now. The early believers called their communion love feast. In fact, many unbelievers would come to the worship gatherings thinking it was just a big party, only to discover that they were worshiping a crucified leader who had come back from the grave. And then the early church exploded and the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. This morning, <clears throat> I'm gonna ask that you stand with me this morning. And I wanna, we're gonna pray together, but we're gonna take a few extra minutes. I'm through early for a reason. I want us to stand in the presence of the Lord this morning. Maybe you don't have a habit of lifting your hands, but the reason I lift my hands is I come as a child to surrender. By lifting my hands, I'm saying Christ is king, I'm not. He's my king, Jesus is my king. Christ is my Lord. My life was radically and forever altered and changed when I found Jesus. So I lift my hands in holy reverence. So if you're okay with that today, would you just lift your hands before the Lord? And I'm gonna ask you to do something bold today. I woke up this morning and the Lord gave me a very clear picture for this next moment. He said, my people are not praying bold enough prayers. My people are not praying prayers that is in line with the faith that I have put in them. In other words, I want you to pray for a miracle today. Now this miracle can be for something that's going on in your life right now. It could be for something maybe that's happening in your neighborhood that you're aware of. Maybe it's something you just see in our city that's broken. Something in our state or around the world. There's plenty to pray about this morning. But I want you as if you have called Jesus Lord of your life, if you're a person that is welcoming the Holy Spirit into your life, I think our prayers need to be bolder than they've been. All a miracle is, is that you're inviting God into a natural realm of space to do something that only he can do. That's a miracle. You're asking God to do something that only he can do. There's no other, no other way to get it done except God intervene. That's a miracle. And I have seen too many miracles not to believe in them. Come on, all the saints in the room, you've seen too many, don't stop believing now. Come on, you've seen God's faithfulness hundreds if not thousands of times in your life. You have seen God intervene. Don't stop praying now. In fact, raise your voices and call upon the name of the Lord. Holy Spirit, come and do miracles in this place today. If you're sick in your body, if you've been given a grave diagnosis, I'm asking today for a miracle in your life. If you have a prodigal that's deconstructed their faith and walked away, I'm praying today in Jesus' name that they come to their senses and that something supernatural happen in their body and their life, their eyes would be open, the veil that is in front of their face would come off and they would turn and walk back toward the Father's house right now, at this hour even, even at this moment. Come and shift the atmosphere, Lord. Come and do things in our lives that only you can do. You're the God of miracles. And we welcome the Holy Spirit.
Come on, sing this song as a prayer. Sing this song as a, a declaration of what you believe. In just a few minutes, Pastor Brad's gonna come and lead us to the table of the Lord. But let's worship together as a church that believes in the power of God. Holy Spirit, we need you. Fill this place. Fill our lives. We sing. And we are waiting. We are watching. We won't move without you. And we won't move without you. And we are hoping, anticipating. Oh yeah. And we won't move without you. We won't move without you. Hands lifted all over the room. Let's ask the Lord this morning. Spirit of God. Come on here. Fall.
Will you grab your communion elements with me and get ready to receive from the Lord? When we come to the table of the Lord to receive the bread, the wine, we come to a table of miracles. First and foremost, the miracle that when Jesus died and was laid in that grave, he didn't stay there. He conquered sin, death, and the grave forever and then shares that victory with us. We're a people of the miracle. When we come to the table of the Lord, we come to a table of power. When Jesus gave his life for us, was raised from the dead, we now have access to the Holy Spirit. The scripture teaches us that when we ask, he gives. That we receive the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. Everything about our lives begins to change. Friends, when we come to this table, we come to a table of life, eternal life that changes us individually and collect collectively, that makes us a dynamic church that prays and worships and sees God move on, the, on behalf of people that are hurting around us. We become a church that sees miracles. We become a church that sees goodness break out everywhere we go. We become a church that sees graves turn into gardens and ashes become places of beauty. How can that be? Because Jesus gave his life for us and then conquered sin, death, and the grave. After supper, Jesus took the bread and when he had blessed it, he broke it and he gave it to all his disciples and he said, this is my body broken for you. He's foreshadowing what would he would do on the cross for them. Church, let's partake the bread together. And then he took the cup and he said, I'm about to pour out my blood. That's what he was saying to them. And this blood is a new covenant that can never be broken. For the forgiveness of sins, this is yours. I give it to you. Let's partake. Church, can we celebrate together the power and the life of Jesus that's ours to the cross? Church, can we just thank the Lord for what he's spoken to our hearts today, what he's done in our midst and what he's sending us out to do? Let's give him praise today. God, thank you. Thank you for today. Man, wow. What a rich, layered time we've had. We've experienced God's goodness together. Incredible. You know, Brady mentioned Sometimes we lose our solidarity with the poor. We have a whole team here at our church called our outreach team. 
and you can be a part of it. There's so many opportunities for us to go into the hurting parts of our city, be the hands and feet of Jesus. You can find out more about that. Connect Central out these doors and to the left. Also, if you're new, we'd love to hear your story and talk about next steps of getting involved. We have a really special birthday that we need to acknowledge today before we go. Miss Jeannie Hansen, can you please wave at us? And I think I believe you're in the back of section number one. Yes, there you are, 94 years old today. <laughs> Miss Jeannie's been at our church forever, like 25 years plus. We're so happy we celebrate with you today. I'm um, also, we'd love to invite our altar team forward. If you have any prayer needs whatsoever, don't rush out of here, we're not in a hurry. We'd love to pray with you, hear what's going on. And church, before you go, will you open up your hands? I wanna pray a prayer of blessing, commissioning over you. The family of God gathered at New Life. I pray that you would be filled with the Holy Spirit again today. That you would overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit in your families, in your neighborhoods, in your places of work, in school, that you would represent Jesus, that you would be bold to speak of him and to show others what he's like. Today, will you go knowing that you are both the received of God, that he receives you, but he also sends you out to a broken world. I bless you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. Church, go in peace, have a great week. See you on Sunday, if not sooner.